these five equal groups, right? And there's five in each group. Twenty-five. Yeah, you got it. I'd have to start by saying I'm a learner. I love learning stuff. So, what I think maybe what I want the most is to awake, awaken for kids that sense of how exciting it is to think about things, to learn new things, to do new things. Yesterday you started your first um, mountain climbing practice expedition. And tomorrow we're going to go climb Stone Mountain. And by the way, we don't need ropes and ice axes to climb Stone Mountain, right? That's good. Some people were not so sure. I grew up outside of Boston. I went to college outside of Philadelphia. When I was about to graduate from college, I had a um, a chance to work for the Philadelphia School Board. That was a really exciting time for education. People, especially in the inner city, were doing very exciting things. And the man I worked for was very cool. So this guy said to me, well, there's this great workshop going on and I can't do it and I want to send you as my spy. Will you go every day to this workshop for teachers and it's called a workshop in creative education. And I said, yeah, okay. And so I was the youngest person in it. We spent every day for two weeks um, exploring science things, paint, doing um, painting, uh, having a movement class, building stuff with all kinds of construction materials. It was really thrilling. And my only job was to keep um, a journal of everything we did. And for me, I went to a very intellectual college and it was that period of time, the end of the 60s, was really politically um, disorienting. It was, it was a hard time to be young and putting your ideas together. But the thing that came through to me from that workshop is how much I learned things by doing them. If you're working on this one, you're gonna to have to make some rectangles that are bigger than the geoboard. So this is helpful. I'm afraid my rubber band is gonna snap. What used to? And it it pointed up the situation I was in, which was at an institution that was very abstract and very completely in their head, and nobody was doing things with their body. But every day, I just rejoiced in, you know building stuff and figuring things out, making, you know, doing experiments with bubbles and um, uh, playing movement games where we crawled around on the floor. I was probably the most enthusiastic person in the group. I went into this classroom in Philadelphia where there was a teacher, her name was Lovie Glenn. She was full of energy and she had a first grade class and she would do things like jump up on the table and say, we're gonna have a parade and all the kids would go, okay, we're gonna have a parade. And then she'd tell them how she wanted them to make their instruments and they would be making their instruments and I had no idea you could be a teacher like that. There was a film about her um, in the end of the 60s. Yeah. Sure you are, standing on your head. I wanted to be more like the teacher I would grow into, but I didn't want to be the teachers I had known growing up, even though some of them I liked. I didn't want to be one of those. And I wasn't 100% sure that there was room in the world for any more than just Lovey Glenn in that other category, you know? I mean, whether schools let you be like that. I came to Paideia in uh, 1983. You know, it's because Paul came and sat in our living room in Watertown, Mass, and laughed and chatted and talked to us that we're here because he was so engaging. I think at Paideia, especially when we first came, we felt really free to embed ourselves. So I want you to use your imagination and keep going. Think about weather, plants, animals, people. I mean, I know you've said two things. If you know that a child needs to read, 
and you know reading starts in these ways, developmentally it does these things, and as you get older and, and a better reader, you start to do these things, well, you look at the kid where they are. You work with what walks in the door. Will be needed on the march. Uh, in, uh, if our weakest and youngest are to survive. I think this classroom looks like a classroom because we have places to keep the tools we need and we have places to do different kinds of work. And some of the work is talking, and we're usually in the meeting area doing that. So you guys are the ones who had the hardest time working together yeah. yesterday. With the fractions, don't get too um, excited, too energetic, because um, you, it, it could kind of get kind of frustrating. And some of the work we do on flat spaces, so we're usually at tables doing that. And some of the work we do outdoors, and we have the tools we need, which also involve toys. And there are things that you use your imagination with. But it does also reflect a lot of years. So there's a lot of things in this room that came from other years and that are fun to talk about. Like we raised a rooster one year and his name was Peep and we have a chicken collection and um, pictures of Peep in it. And so we'll talk about that sometimes. I really think the best thing for a classroom is diversity between the two teachers. So when I worked with Roger, he was younger, I was older, he was male, I was female, that was great. Then I worked with Keisha, and we were both female, but she was at least way younger and African-American. That brought a diversity. And then Keisha left, and Tony, oh my gosh, he's gonna be even younger than Keisha and he's male, and he's African-American? Are you kidding? This is wonderful. I just f always feel like that's a very lively, wonderful thing to have. If the two teachers can be really good at communicating with each other across all those divisions, then it's gonna be very good for kids. He's just so much fun. And he has such a good time with them. He's so kind. He's so sensitive to kids. Hey guys, um... Yeah, but for right now, I gotta read with him. Okay. They would just follow him anywhere. I like the way second and third graders can read interesting things. They can make things with their hands, but they can still totally imagine themselves into something else at the drop of a hat. If you can get their imagination involved, all these kids are more able to write, you know, or able to draw, or able to speak. They want to think about what's what's true and what's right and how people should behave. And there's a lot about that fairness and justice that's compelling for them. We should do meditation. So well, they had four people and every, all the other groups had five. That's so true. it'd be... No, these guys had four people. We, wait, they have six, we have five, and they have four. And so if no, we take five, five kids, they have five. Five, five, five four. We don't have a formal curriculum in paying attention. And the children that I see every year need more ability to pay attention than they ever have. It really didn't matter as much 30 years ago if you drifted off a little. The day wasn't so crowded with things. There were, I don't know, it, the pace was different. It, it's harder for kids now. Sometimes they go outside and jump, jump rope and their jump ropes hanging in a closet, a little um, shed, and they take them and they just jump. We think that it helps them organize themselves to have that physical release of energy so they've done some work. Now they're gonna 
get rid of some energy, and it just helps them with the rest of their day. I realized that I've always been doing things with kids that invite them to be meditative. Close your eyes. Feel the back of your legs against the floor. I've always taken interesting objects and had them pass from hand to hand, where people might not have any idea what this is. And all you need to do is say what it feels like or smells like or looks like. And that's almost a meditation right there because I'm asking them to be very present with that object. Bring your attention to your stuffed animal. Just feel how this animal feels on you right this minute. We benefit from being able to consciously bring ourselves back to the present moment, to consciously stop our distractions. Let your eyes be soft, not looking at anything. Just soft, resting. It took me a while to have confidence in my own ability to teach meditation because it, it felt like a very um, intimate place to go. Intimate for me and intimate for kids. I didn't want anybody to be upset or to feel like a, a boundary had been stepped over. But, but as I learned more about meditation, I kept thinking there shouldn't be a boundary here. If people are feeling a boundary, um, if, if people do feel like they're um, their child shouldn't be learning this in school. I think I can talk them, to them about that. It's a little scary. I think it's the right thing to do. It's very sad. It's hard to imagine letting go of this space. It's such a part of me, but it's just a space. You know, it's like, it needs to go on and turn into something else, and it will. You know how we talked about what makes your handwriting really good? If yours is ready to be checked, you can give it to me. Find yourself a spot on the floor. So this is sort of like saying, instead of seven times nine, it's seven times nine times 10. What does it have on it, the last Restaurant. Restaurant. Only one. I really prefer to leave at the top of my game. And I don't think anybody else has started noticing how much I, you know, forget what we're doing this afternoon, but I don't want to go there. I feel the season changing, and it, and it feels like something that I'm meant to respect. It's time to do something else. And I'm willing to believe myself even though I don't know what that is yet. I'm sort of tickled that somebody wants to make a movie of me. <laughs> I feel very flattered and very blessed to be here, to have been here, and to, uh, I don't know, the idea that somebody wants uh, to, to put together my thoughts and, about this, it's really nice.